One of the things we've been conscious of as we, as we went through the discussions to plan this conference was how do we take this abstract concept of the open internet, the open web, and, and discuss it and make it applicable to real humans living on the ground in communities. This is a core mission of Knight Foundation. This is the core mission of the Center for Civic Media, not coincidentally. Um, and so one silo where we thought we would try to tease that, have that discussion, is in the realm of science. And, and thinking about the way this open platform that we all have, and that increasingly tools like these that we all have in our pockets, and, and other tools that we can hack together increasingly cheaply, that those can be used to inf by ourselves, by normal human beings, uh, often ner the nerdier normal human beings, um, to, to observe, to measure, to map, to understand what's going on in the environment around us um, and in the, the larger citizen science movement. So today we have four five-minute talks coming up from some of the leading organizations in this citizen science space, as well as one emerging one. Um, and then we'll have a brief conversation, and we really want to, again, living the what's enabled by that, have a conversation with you all. So I'm going to introduce each of them individually, uh, and we'll, we'll come up in a series. The first is Sean Bonner from SafeCast. Hi. So I am going to try to jam a 45-minute talk into about 60 seconds because John makes it seem like this was all very well planned, but we only figured this out a few minutes ago. So uh, very quickly, uh, the overview of what SafeCast is. As you guys know, back in um, 2011, there was this huge earthquake in Japan, uh, which triggered a leak at the uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and resulted in all sorts of uh, drama surrounding that, mostly because there was no information available and people didn't know what was going on. And it wasn't necessarily that there was information out there that people couldn't find. It was just that there was nothing, there, nobody was paying attention to this at all. And so a, f a handful of friends and I got together and thought that perhaps we could uh, use our communities and, and skills and stuff and, and help with this. So we thought, let's get a whole bunch of Geiger counters, give them out to people, and then get those readings, and then there'll at least be some sort of information. But the problem with that right away was that there were no Geiger counters available anywhere. They sold out right away. So. Our second plan was get duct tape, take, tape a Geiger counter to a window in a car, and drive around with it, taking pictures with our iPhones that were geotagged, and then map those out. So we were able to get a ton of data with one device, um, although that was the worst possible way to do it. And so we came up with a new plan, and we designed a whole platform, uh, hardware, software, and uh, data to collect this. We tracked cars, people drive all around, collect this data, and then we started getting a much better picture of what was going on. We actually published the data immediately that showed that the evacuation areas were wrong. They had to change where people were being moved to and from because of this. And the data that we're collecting now uh, is all the way down to street level as opposed to huge averages, which was the little bit that was available before. So we can get data all the way down to an individual GPS point anywhere in the world where we have devices. And being open, giving these devices out to people all over the place for getting data from everywhere. So we started this with zero, absolutely no data available, and uh, it's been climbing pretty quickly to today, right now, we're just shy of 20 million data points in 53 countries around the world. It's the largest data set of uh, open radiation data that's available anywhere. Um, everything we're doing, again, is open. So all of our software is open source, all the hardware. Anybody can, can go to the website, get any of it. They can build these devices themselves, collect this data, publish it back to us. We have a kit that's available if people want to uh, you know, save the time of trying to source all the parts themselves. They can grab it from us. There's over 300 of these out in the world collecting data right now. Uh, we're building out a fixed sensor network, which is setting up an early warning system, which was something that didn't exist at all before, and hopefully that will help. And it's not just in Japan. We're doing this all over the place again. We're also now looking at how uh, the platform that we built for radiation uh, might play out into other uh, environmental data sources that are not immediately apparent when you walk outside and look. So we're doing air quality and possibly some weather and, and other things. All right, thanks. Four minutes.
Next up, from Sky Truth, David Manthos. Morning. So I want to talk to you all this morning about uh, citizen science, satellites, and sky truth things. So this is an idea around uh, the internet of everything, a concept that's been tossed around quite a lot. And so if we can preserve the, uh, the DIY makerspace ethos of the open internet, what can we do to connect um, people and data and technology to solve some of the most pressing environmental issues of our time? So SkyTruth is an environmental organization. Uh, it can be applied to many other areas and topics, but uh, we focus on using uh, these technologies to look at the human impact on planet Earth, a uh, big picture view of impacts like mining, the offshore oil drilling and oil spills that come with that, uh, hydraulic fracturing, what the impact on the landscape looks like. So all of these issues, it's a bird's eye view, if you will. If uh, birds could fly 400 miles above the Earth, 17,000 miles an hour, uh, satellites can do that. And the data that is available from them uh, is growing every day. Uh, I just wanted to, I'm not going to dwell on the technology too much, but uh, this is an image of where we are right now, up at the top of the screen. Uh, this was taken Sunday, uh, and I downloaded it yesterday in this room for free. Not only could I not have done that 20 years ago, back in the 1980s, to attain this image would have cost thousands of dollars, about $4,400 for an image like this. Uh, so not only are the sensors and the availability of the information, all these you can download, millions of images from Landsat, images from NASA. You can download these for free. But the technology is also is recently evolving that uh, people can access this. It, would have taken back in the 80s and the 90s huge amounts of technical experience to even know what to do with an image. And so SkyTruth for a while was uh, very much an expert uh, organization. We were saying, here's gas drilling out on public lands in Wyoming. This is what a fragmented landscape requires. But this is just us talking and telling the world what we see. Uh, and that's very useful, like when an oil, sp or an oil well blows out in the Gulf of Mexico and you have millions of gallons spilling into the Gulf. Being able to say in the early days on satellite imagery that this is how big the spill is. It can't possibly just be a thousand barrels of oil a day. But again, this is all just us telling other people what we see. And really the dream for Sky Truthing was that any person could get this kind of information to know what's happening in their place that they care about. So uh, about a year later, after the BP spill, we started with a very uh, cobbled together system to take geospatial data. Uh, at first, it was just information from the Coast Guard's National Response Center. These are where oil and hazardous chemical spills are reported. Uh, it's a very clunky uh, text-only form that gets sent out to a bunch of emergency responders. And we said, well, OK, we can take that data. We can stick that point on a map, in a Google Maps, so people know what that looks like. And we can put all the information into an email. And we can just send it to, initially, it was just to us, that we wanted to know, all right, every day, tell me where I should look on satellite images for an oil slick. Uh, and then we realized, well, we can turn this out to the public. We can start sending this out. So if you care about uh, the refinery that's next door, we'll send you the notifications when that refinery starts leaking 200 pounds of hydrogen cyanide every day. And that has that led uh, to added more data into that system, uh, but we still didn't have imagery yet. We wanted people to see what's happening on the ground. And so that led to uh, this iteration we started um, with uh, our first real true sky truthing project back in August of last year, which is taking all the spatial data for uh, oil wells, gas wells in Pennsylvania that are going to be hydraulically fractured, and all of the aerial imagery back to 2005, putting those together and showing people one well at a time, and just asking them, okay, we know that there's supposed to be a well drilled here. Do you see a well pad? Okay, yes, you see a well pad. Do you see uh, huge waste lagoons that are holding hundreds of thousands of gallons of, uh, of fracking water? D you know, there's an issue for public health if you live next to one of those. So uh, we have had th several thousand people uh, participate in this project, uh, hundreds of thousands of image analysis tasks. We have to have a lot of people look at the same image so that they don't uh, give us a wrong answer uh, 
so we average out and take the correct answers. And this gives us the ability to look at uh, the bigger picture things. And in Pennsylvania, this data is going to a public health study. So uh, are those waste ponds a source of air contamination? We're working with Johns Hopkins on that. And hopefully we can expand this to other broader issues. So if you care about an issue like oil pollution, we can show you a satellite image of, uh, of places and get you to know what an oil slick looks like. Or do you care about a place like uh, the Theodore Roosevelt National Park? We'll tell you all the imagery and all the data that we have about that so that people can see what's happening in the world and that they have a part in the science of understanding it. Thanks. Thank you, David. Our next presenter is Jeff Warren from the Public Laboratory of Science. everyone. Um, I actually don't have slides, but I have some nice pictures that are going to go by as I talk. So um, This is the front page of the Public Lab website, publiclab.org. You should check it out. Um, I guess when trying to explain what Public Lab is, sometimes I kind of get, I stumble on it because there's lots of different sides of it. So I've been sort of uh, trying to explain it in the sense of uh, comparing it to other things. Like uh, we're sort of like Wikipedia crossed with the Homebrew Computer Club, crossed with Greenpeace a little bit. But the problem with that, I think, is that each of those leads to a different kind of misunderstanding. Like, people initially think, oh, Greenpeace, so you're about conservation. I mean, I really like whales, but, uh, but, but we're, we're an organization that's sort of based in environmental justice, which is more about human health than it is about um, whale health. So, so I think that's one misunderstanding. People assume that we're creating environmental sensors to go out and, and measure the environment and see how the environment is doing. But actually, it's more about the risks to your, yourself and your family and your health that, that, we're, that we're concerned about. So Public Lab, who, who are we? Uh, it's, we're a community of about uh, four to 5,000 people around the world who are collaborating to develop inexpensive environmental monitoring techniques. Um, that's sort of the Wikipedia side of it. Like people upload plans, designs, ideas, they critique each other's work, they collaborate um, across continents to develop cheap sensors. And while the cheap sensors are sort of the, the leverage, right, that without access to scientific monitoring equipment, you can't really, uh, you know, challenge the status quo in terms of people's understanding of pollution issues. I think the second misunderstanding people make is sort of the homebrew computer club side of things, that, that we're primarily a group that is developing technologies, and that that's the, the, the tools, the kits, those are, those are the center of public lab. And actually, I would say that more than a community that is just posting a bunch of gadgets online and, and sharing them, the thing that we as a community are most trying to construct is actually communities of expertise and communities of practice themselves. Um, so th the technologies will come and go, right? You're going you're gonna, to, a lot of it, you know, we're basing on, uh, say, to photograph an oil spill or to measure uh, to measure a contaminant. We're using things like digital cameras, we're using webcams, we're using bits and pieces that we find. Those things are going to change. We're riding on a lot of economies of scale, using products you buy in the store. But the thing that we're trying to build is a community which is able to innovate solutions to their immediate problems. People who can rely on each other, who have a sense of expertise, of knowledge, of the risks that they face around their home and their neighborhood. So I, I think that Increasingly, I'm trying not to talk about the gadgets, although they're fun. Um, I'm trying to talk more and more, as I explain Public Lab, about the people who, through the connections they build and the, the, the problems they tackle, are actually the thing that we're creating at Public Lab. So the third thing, I think, I guess this is sort of on the Wikipedia side of thing, is uh, are we a citizen science organization? And I think, I guess we are, but I, I think that the word citizen science, or the, the, the term, tends to, it tends to, emphasize this sense of um, all the data out there being gathered into a s towards a single point. It, it neglects the question, who is we? Like, who is, who is we that, that, are, that are gathering this all? And a lot of times, the answer is, it's scientists. Um, so, or, or like, sorry, I got distracted because I made a Chrome extension. Uh, this is, you should download it. It replaces all instances of the word scientist on the entire internet with scientists with quotation marks. <laughs> so, uh, go get it. Um, but, but what I'm, what I'm talking about here is that, that, that scientists or government or industry, um, they're sort of like at the center of their respective networks. They're at the top of the, the pyramid, you know? So uh, citizen science often refers to collecting vast amounts of data and pooling it and then analyzing it. But who is actually analyzing it? 
It's, it's, we're talking about big data here, right? And I think that the public lab approach doesn't necessarily um, presume that, we're, that we, like the staff of public lab or whatever, are going to collect it all and then sort of make decisions based on it. And I think that the way that this relates to a lot of the conversations we've heard today and yesterday in terms of big data, in terms of smart cities, is when you do that, when you have this sort of pyramidal uh, network diagram and you collect all the data to one point and then you have certain sort of preferred uh, experts who, who get to sift through that data, I, and I'm not just talking about you know, Facebook or Google, uh, I'm talking also about you know, uh, governments and also just, just scientists, just experts, people who have the knowledge and wherewithal and resources to do that analysis and perhaps aren't thinking in the sense of like a, dis, like a decentralized discursive public they get to make decisions on behalf of everyone else. They get to make decisions for them because they, they have an asymmetrically large amount of data. They're, they're not sharing the decision-making process. And as, you know, as we in our sort of society today increasingly depend on science and technology to justify decisions and to sort of motivate good decision-making, that's a real problem because if people aren't involved in the analysis of the data, I'm not just talking about the collection, like going out and banding birds or, or taking water samplers or whatever, and that's great, but actually looking at the trends, understanding them, and, and inferring things from them, advocating for different things based on the data, participating in that whole data life cycle, past the collection point all the way to where you say, okay, now we've understood the issue, now let's, as a society, decide to do something about it and decide to do this about it, and reaching consensus or, or at least reaching disagreements. Those are the parts that I think are missing from the, this idea of smart cities and, and, and from the sort of broader idea of big data. So I think what, what Public Lab is trying to do is to get people involved in all those different parts of the data lifecycle. So it's not just about collecting data and handing it to someone who knows what to do with it. It's not just about getting enough data to the right people who can make the decisions for you. It's actually about data and participation in its production, its analysis, um, and the advocacy that comes after it, that's something that everyone has a responsibility to be part of in, in our democracy. So I guess that's sort of the big picture that's, that's a lot of stuff to tackle. But, um, but I think that if you only do the beginning or you only do the end, you're going to miss out on what is really a participatory form of government. So anyway, that's sort of public lab in a kind of large nutshell. Thank you. <laughs>
So it turns out that water, monitoring water quality is really complex. Ideally, you'd have a sensor that would just be like good or bad, but it's way more complex than that. Um, there's various aspects of a water system that you need to keep in balance, like dissolved oxygen and nitrogen. You may want to be measuring for a specific pollutant in the system, like arsenic or mercury. Um, and then one of the most complicated things about water, of course, is that it's always changing. It changes over time. It's a system. It's a complex system. So rather than making a separate test for every possible thing that you might want to test your water system for, our approach has been to model our hardware and our instrument after the idea of a thermometer. So the thermometer takes your temperature, and the thermometer tells you you have a fever and that there's something going on, but the thermometer doesn't diagnose you. It doesn't say, like, oh, you have the flu or you have a virus or something like that. Um, researchers like Mark Green have been demonstrating recently how conductivity actually can serve this purpose. So conductivity in relationship to other measurements like temperature and depth um, can show us this correlative relationship with pollutants in the system. And so far, he's been looking at uh, arsenic and chloride and is, is looking at other pollutants as well. Um, and so this is actually pretty exciting because what it means is that conductivity can be an indicator for something's wrong, just the same way that our body temperature is an indication that something is wrong in the body. So there are water logging technologies out there being widely used by researchers. Um, so these measure water data over time. Uh, these are around $1,500 for measuring, which is actually not that bad, but the fact is that one in isolation doesn't really tell you that much about a water system. So you need to deploy multiple things of these, which means that the cost goes up. Um, so here's our initial stab <laughs> at a water monitoring system. We call it the riffle, and I think Don is going to hold it up and maybe even like pass it around <laughs> and people can take a look at it. Um, and so the, the riffle uh, monitors conductivity, temperature, and depth. Basically the same thing that those commercial water loggers are measuring for about a tenth of the price is what we're looking at right now. So it's comprised of these um, a thermistor and uh, an audio cable, which is actually being used to measure conductivity, sticking out of the top. Um, and <laughs> then a custom circuit board, but which is based around the Arduino, and then three AA batteries, which all fit in a either a typical water bottle or we're exploring other kinds of enclosures for them right now as well. Um, and so here's, you know, there's a bunch of ways you could potentially use this. So if you're interested in monitoring uh, downstream pollution from a particular point, like a farm or factory, you could deploy a pair of these and be testing you know, sort of what are the changes in these measurements. Um, it, you could be monitoring in a private well, so you put a single one in, hopefully in conjunction with other people in your area that are also monitoring that. Or if you wanted to measure an entire system, you could deploy a bunch of these to get a very high spatial and temporal resolution of data. Um, and so one of the other challenges in this space is um, open software and open data. So a lot of the software systems are proprietary. The data formats are also proprietary. So we've been working with Jeff Walker, who's a postdoc out of Tufts, to think about a very simple software platform where people using the Riffle could upload their data and share their data across uh, a wide network um, and also discuss it and visualize it. Um, so the open community part of this, we are being incubated through Public Lab, and they've been really awesome supporters of this project. And so the great thing about working in an open community format is just this possibility for rapid distributed innovation. So these are just two examples of you know, how things have worked so far. So like the top one is sort of how our label design has evolved. You know, one person does one thing, another person puts up another thing, and so on and so forth. Um, and then the bottom slide here is sort of our iterative process for develop, you know, arriving at that insight around measuring conductivity with an audio cable. You basically need two metal points, and you need to be measuring the voltage drop between those across the water. Um, and so we needed a stability of uh, sort of points there. So we first started with this 3D printed cap with wires. We moved to a model with two screws. Um, and then someone had this great invention of the, the audio cable, which really simplified things. So in any case, these are our pilot sites and partners that we're hoping to deploy with and work with on the project. Um, and then finally, our model of open education is something that we're currently seeking funding for. We want to. Um, 
uh, pilot an engagement model where we create civic nodes around environmental monitoring at the watershed level. Um, so the civic nodes are based on this idea of creating the time and space to bring together people who already care and are invested in the idea of water quality, um, and then who can help translate that into data collection, advocacy, and storytelling to broader publics. Um, and so we'd love to talk with more of you about how we can engage journalists and journalism students in this kind of thing. And anyone else who's interested, just join our uh, mailing list on the public website. So thanks very much. <laughs>
our stuff fits in that. Uh, and for us, uh, also building off what you guys are saying, I think we're, we have sort of the, the real scientists or whatever working with us as co-creators and collaborators on this project. We're using their research in the development of the hardware. Um, that we're using the software knowledge that has come out of ex their extensive experience doing water quality monitoring. We're also using the, that knowledge from Patrick Heron, for example, who does water quality monitoring in the Mystic, which is an, an environmental advocacy organization. Um, and so I see it more around, um, in a sense, what our role might be is to stage encounters between the people that have expertise, but who might be seeking a greater component of how do you like leverage that knowledge and get it out into the public, and then bringing together people who have already an interest in water and water quality monitoring for specific sort of community-based reasons. So it's like how do you stage encounters and create space and time for those audiences to come together and share that knowledge? And how do you do that? I mean, what, how does I don't one know. We haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, th I think that's that's sort of what I was showing at the end is that um, in the model that we want to pilot is basically creating a program that would be based at the watershed level that would bring together what we're calling these civic nodes, which would include um, sort of scientists, educators, the uh, environmental advocacy groups. I mean, not all of them at the same time, but like sort of these representatives of each one at that particular watershed level, um, and then journalists as well. And, and thinking about each of those groups has then this broader audience that they communicate back to, to which their opinion means something. So like the academics communicate back to an academic community, and that has a huge import for, for how knowledge gets, gets, gets pushed forward. But journalists communicate to the public. That has also a huge um, value in, in bringing public attention to something. And so um, that's, that's the thing that we want to pilot, but it's definitely not figured out and maybe the how about the other how do you guys specifically deal with relate with work with ally with journalists well there's, there's actually a discussion about a month ago on, on one of the public lab lists uh, about um, you know the role of, of inexpensive sensors and DIY technologies uh, for environmental uh, research in in journalism and it was sort of a split crowd a lot of people uh, you know, coming from the journalism space, a lot of people from the sort of uh, the tech area or the, ad, you know, the activism side of things, people saying, well, you know, do journalists have the time and resources to do long-form investigative work in the environmental space and to, to sort of uh, tool up and, and learn these techniques and, and so forth? And a lot of people were saying that, you know, that's, the, that's what they have to do to, 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 you know, in modern journalism. Some people were saying there's no way anyone's going to have the time or money to, to pursue those things, or at least the time if the, if the tools are cheap. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of opportunities for partnerships there where uh, journalists can uh, get in contact with and begin collaborating with citizen groups who are living in the areas that are affected, that are doing monitoring on their own, and can you know collaborate, share data, and they don't necessarily have to learn how to build a sensor or, or use it or whatever, th they should think of f local folks as, as a, a resource, as, as a pool of expertise, as people who really deeply understand a problem and are deeply invested in it. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's where the, the real magic is going to happen. I, yeah, I'm can I, can I throw no. something on there real quick? Uh, you should totally add journalist to the, <laughs> <laughs> to the Chrome thing because that, that, that's, that plays into this a lot. You know, I mean, given, given the open piece again, everything's available for, for people. So there's a little bit of, of how much people are interested in being a part of it. And so um, we see with SafeCast everything from journalists who write full stories about what we're doing without ever speaking to anybody and just sort of pulling, pulling little bits and pieces out of other stories that they found around or you know, copying one line off our website or something to people who fly to where we're at or come visit our volunteers that, that go out in the field with us, that collect data, that get one of our own devices, that see how it works themselves and everything in between there. So I think that by making everything available, there's, there's a huge wealth of information for journalists to take that and write very compelling pieces and, and pass that information on. And so there's a little bit, a little bit of that is more in the, in the hands of the journalists, whether they actually are gonna move on that or, or not. I want to pick on, I, I'm been look, peering out there in the lights to see if Jeremy Gilbert from National Geographic is there. Um, I, I wondered, Jeremy, if, if as Ethan maybe slowly wakes, makes his way back to you with the mic, or maybe you can come towards this way. I, I, so Jeremy works at National Geographic, which has done a little bit around science and a little bit around journalism, has a 130-year 
uh, legacy in the space. I'm curious to get your reactions with your, your Nat Geo pith helmet on. Only 126 years, so oh. not that old. No, I mean, I think the one thing that's really interesting that we have spent a lot of time thinking about is the, the difference, not, not in who's a scientist, because I love the idea that everyone is potentially a scientist and everyone is collecting data, and I think you've already touched a little bit on the analysis part of it. But one of the things that's really interesting, I think, for me about the frame of National Geographic is that we're interested in funding science, we're interested in telling great stories, and we're also interested in education. And I guess the question I would pose to the panel particularly is about the educational component, which is one of the things we've run into is that data collection is different than analysis, but it's also different than asking the questions that each of you have asked that led to the projects where you're collecting that data. I was wondering what you have been able to do to start people thinking about asking not questions of a scientist, but scientific questions, questions that can be proven, proven with your kind of data. Well, I think that getting at the sort of environmental justice um, origins of the, the work that we're doing and, and the, the fact that we work with a lot of environmental justice groups, uh, many people actually start with the, the question. They, don't, they aren't looking for education necessarily, um, and education is sort of almost a byproduct because, the, you know, the, like folks in, in the Gulf Coast during the BP spill were like, well, is this, are these uh, tar balls or are they, is this organic material of some sort? Is, uh, what's going on here? Is my family safe? They, they have very pressing questions. Uh, and, and in some cases, uh, you know, they just want an answer. They don't want to have to fiddle with some device or something, right? Uh, but, but some people, I think, have the, a little bit more, um, you know, time resources and they can, they can step back and say, if, Everyone had easy ways to to uh, determine these things, to identify contaminants, to uh, you know check on these things. Then then we'd be in a better position in the first place. Um, so so I guess that's that's part of it. I, I think I would add that uh, our projects and the idea of Sky Truth thing of putting all of this imagery and data out in front of people is maybe in a way a subliminal education that. Uh, we want to offer an opportunity for people to take part in a scientific project, you know, some, something that's a take action that's more than just adding your name to a petition. But as they're going through uh, hundreds of images of well pads in state forest land, in uh, on people's farms, right next to houses, that eventually sinks in that you start to see this is all of the impact that already exists and this is all of the area that could potentially be impacted in the future. So I think having people go through that process and, and learning about what things to look for in an image is uh, sort of a subliminal education, even if they're just coming as a, I want to take action in some sort of area. Well, you know, with, with radiation, it's a very political topic, and there's lots of hot uh, discussions surrounding it um, from all different sides. And so uh, we, try to, we try to further that conversation as much as possible without, without taking a definitive stand on it one way or another. So we have mailing lists and, and blog posts and things where we uh, point to people who are doing analysis and we provide the data for people who are doing analysis and, and try to create a forum where these discussions can come from and where people can, can look at the data and try to gather something useful and interesting from it um, without you know, keeping the data to ourselves and saying, oh, here's what it means. Yeah, and I, I just want to say that I think that that question is really important and I think it points at a opportunity in this space to think more programmatically about how engagement happens and how education happens and what are the ways that people come into that. I mean, a lot of times we think like, it's, it, like it's very empowering. The discourse of citizen science and citizen journalism are very empowering to think that like we could all do this. But then actually getting people to that point, especially if people aren't prepared to like to vote their lives to it, um, is I, I, I just think that's a whole realm of, of sort of social design that we can think together about. And I, that's what I'm hoping can start to emerge from all of us working together, I guess, on this, are, are new forms of engagement models where we think really concretely about like, then we will create this opportunity and these couple stakeholders will be at the table and then this thing will happen from there. Whereas it's not just about like we put it out there, but we think really concretely about how we get to those next steps. I think we have time for one more question and if there's not one, I, I want to riff off something Catherine and I were talking about earlier and, and off of your point right there about how we engage with other audiences. Simultaneous to this conference, there's a conference taking place right now called Next Library 
where they're talking about the future of libraries and how to reinvent and rethink libraries as civic institutions. And as you heard yesterday, um, we, I think Knight Foundation it sees libraries as very much as a key institution for connecting with humans where they live in their neighborhoods. And I wonder, as you think about other institutions, whether the libraries or other civically based institutions, where you're most excited, where you see the greatest potential, whether it's schools or libraries or if there are other, other well, things. Yeah, so I'll jump in that real quick. You know, one of, one of the things that was core to SafeCast founding was, was the hackerspace culture. I run a hackerspace in Los Angeles. We work very closely with the hackerspace in Tokyo. So all these hackerspaces working together is, is how SafeCast exists. So it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't without that network. And so I'm, I've been very excited to see um, sort of the hackerspace, makerspace uh, influx into uh, libraries. In Los Angeles, one of the main libraries um, in Koreatown is gonna be hosting the, the LA makerspace on their whole second floor. I know there's a lot of other library systems around the country that are working closely in putting makerspaces and, and hackerspaces and fab labs and things actually into their spaces. And so I think that um, giving that information, excuse me, and helping the community sort of get more involved in that sort of hands-on making piece of it, uh, I'm really excited about where that's going to head. Yeah. And uh, environmental uh, or uh, student groups, especially environmental student groups on campuses, that has been a great opportunity for us. We've really seen engagement. We got some people just coming to the website organically uh, to look through these tools we're providing, but really sitting people down at a um, in a room, ordering a bunch of pizza, and just saying, let's spend a couple hours and, and go through uh, a couple thousand images and processing that. That has really gotten people sitting in one place talking about an issue, even if it's uh, not quite so creative as the hackerspace idea. It's engaged uh, a group of people in an event. Uh, Jeff, I know with you guys, you guys have even used like public marketplaces as places to engage people where they are. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, one thing that I guess we do a lot is we organize uh, in-person events all over the world, and uh, and by we I mean like we have a, a fairly large organizers network of people who are interested not only in the monitoring and so forth, but in actually, you know, creating groups of people, uh, cultivating uh, you know uh, sort of local chapters of public lab to tackle specific problems, and so the the sort of local meetup has been uh, a backbone of that of that sort of growth. People get together, they uh, pitch to each other sort of updates on projects they've been working on, they ask for help on things, uh, people exchange tips, they actually bring devices, you know, monitoring devices, or they ask about uh, data they brought, and uh, there's a, a real sort of important uh, aspect to in-person meetings and the sort of bonds that you create and the connections you create there. Um, we also have uh, periodic regional and, and uh, international events. We have. Uh, that we call the barn raisings, um, sort of after the Amish barn raising idea of like coming together to make something. And, and typically those are done at sites where there is an environmental justice concern. Um, uh, the, the one that we have every year is uh, south of New Orleans in a place called Cocodry. And it's uh, in a place where, you know, as we're sort of enjoying ourselves after the conference day is over and people have made a bunch of things, you can sit there and actually see a refinery flare, you know, a mile down the road, you can see a lot of the hardware from the oil and gas operations in the area out in the in the wetlands as you're canoeing around there. And I think that that sort of immediacy of the issues that, that people face uh, ins inspires and, and sort of keeps people focused on those sorts of problems as opposed to just uh, making stuff. Um, but it's sort of a hybrid of this. So. Catherine, what's the next place that you're excited about engaging people? We were so excited about the library, uh, the Chicago Library's News Challenge winner. So we've been talking a lot about that, actually. <laughs> cool. I think that's a great way to end. Um, thank you. Please give a, a round of applause for our, for our presenters here today.